Welcome to this rapid revision video on Renaissance causes and treatments of disease. When we looked at medieval medicine, I treated causes and treatments quite separately in their own videos, but this time I'm going to be looking at them both in the same video. Like last time though, we're going to split this between supernatural and natural ideas. In fact, the Renaissance saw a move away from some supernatural ideas, but let's quickly recap what is meant by these terms. Supernatural means literally beyond nature. These theories are often spiritual or religious and they rely on an element of faith. Natural ideas, on the other hand, these ideas are based upon what could be observed in the real world. They're often more scientific, but they are not always correct. As the church's grip on learning faded and new theories developed, there was a greater emphasis on the natural or even scientific medical theories. But many supernatural inferences were never far away. We're going to start with the religious and spiritual ideas. Firstly, prayer was still very important. People in the Renaissance remained incredibly religious. People prayed to be healed just as much as they had done in the Middle Ages. However, they were less likely to leave it at just praying. They would likely pray alongside other treatments. There was at this point, especially in Britain, less confessing of sins. This was still done by Catholics, but as the Protestant Reformation took hold in the British Isles, particularly in England and Scotland, this became less common, particularly in periods where Catholics were persecuted and they would have to confess their sins and hold the mass in private. But there was no more pilgrimage. Henry VIII and Edward VI's religious reforms in the 1500s had destroyed the monasteries and the shrines of the saints, like Revo Abbey you can see in the photograph here. This ended the custom of pilgrimage in England for all reasons, including medical. So instead, there was a move towards humanism. Now this promoted the idea that, uh, to, of a return to ancient Greek and Roman thinking and extending people's knowledge of the natural world rather than assuming religious causes. But remember, that didn't mean that they were just going to take Galen and Hippocrates' ideas at face value. They could challenge those too. We're going to focus first of all on causes before we have a look at treatments. How are attitudes changing? Medical knowledge grew with the changing attitudes of people. The general population of Europe wanted better answers to the questions about what caused disease. Epidemics of the plague and other killer diseases such as smallpox, the great pox, which is syphilis, a new disease at the time, and things like the sweating sickness, which we're honestly not sure what that is, could not be easily explained by the theory of the four humours. They affected everybody in the same way and were not cured by traditional humoral treatments like bloodletting and purging. Despite physicians questioning the theory of the four humours, ordinary people still believed in them, so physicians stuck to the old methods. Patients would not pay their doctor to experiment on them. Physicians also now understood that urine was not directly related to a person's health, so they no longer used urine in diagnosis quite so much, apart from some very specific illnesses where it was an obvious link. So does this show continuity in what people believed? Miasma, the idea that disease was spread by bad smells and evil fumes, was constant throughout this period and was now actually the most commonly believed cause of disease ahead of religious explanations. This meant it had also overtaken the theory of the four humours as the most common natural explanation of disease. Miasma was believed to be the product of rotten vegetables, decaying bodies of humans or animals, excrement or any swampy, smelly, dirty place. This added additional emphasis on the importance of hygiene. In the picture here, we can see the classic picture of the plague doctor, not, remember, related to the idea of the Black Death. The bird mask was supposed to ward off the miasma, but also it was supposed to contain a posy, if you like, of sweet smelling herbs, which would help keep the air fresh around the doctor's face. And the hope was that would cure the disease or at the very least prevent it. But what new discoveries and new thinking were also taking place? There were some new discoveries and ideas during the Renaissance about the cause of disease. In 1526, Paracelsus theorised that disease was caused by problems with chemicals inside the body. In 1546, a new text called On Contagion by Girolamo Fracastoro, an Italian physician, theorised that disease was caused by seeds spread in the air. This idea was actually much closer to the truth of germs and viruses but it actually had very little impact at this time, as Fracastoro had no evidence for his theory. But in 1683, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch scientist, had invented a more powerful microscope, which allowed the first recorded observation of bacteria. 
Van Leeuwenhoek, and I do hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, called the bacteria animalcules, although he did not know that these bacteria were, were bacteria, and he did not know that they were linked to disease. That said, germs were still thought to be the result of spontaneous generation, the result of decay, not the cause. In other words, that as things rotted, it produced the germs, and not that things rotted because the germs broke them down. What about treatments then? More of the same? Well, there was a certain amount of continuity in terms of causes, but also some change. Let's compare that with the treatments. Since the public continued to believe in the theory of the four humours, the old treatments which aimed at rebalancing the humours continued as well. Bleeding, purging, sweating were all popular ways of removing too much of a particular humour during the Renaissance period. Herbal remedies also continued to be popular, although their use changed slightly. In around 1500 and up until about 1700, often remedies were chosen because of their colour or shape. For example, yellow herbs such as radish and saffron were used to treat jaundice, a condition which turns the skin yellow. As it happens, it typically indicates poor liver function. Smallpox, which had a red rash as one of the symptoms, was treated with the red cure, drinking red wine and eating red foods and even wearing red clothes, which were considered sort of lucky. Since this was the age of exploration, new herbal remedies started to appear from other countries. New plants appeared from the New World, by which we mean the Americas, but it was a new world to Europeans who had not long since discovered it. This meant that some physicians believed that within each country were herbal remedies which would cure the diseases that came from that country. This was an idea that Thomas Sydenham believed in, which we've looked at before. The appearance of new remedies opened up a huge number of new possibilities for treatments and cures, and we're going to look at some of them now. New remedies that started to appear included sarsaparilla, which is pictured from the New World. This was used to treat the great pox, and ipecacuana from Brazil, better known today as ipecac, which was an effective cure for dysentery. However, it also made you immediately sick very often too. Thomas Sydenham popularised the use of chinchona bark from Peru in treating malaria. Physicians also believed in testing other new arrivals like tea, coffee, nutmeg, cinnamon and tobacco to see if they had any impact on disease. When you think about some of these, they've actually got quite strong smells, so whether this was related to the theory of miasma would kind of make sense. I'd point out, though, that the bark from the trees of the chinchona plant actually would have done some good. It contained quinine, which was an effective treatment for malaria and would be so today. What about really new ideas like chemical cures and other things? Well, one new popular theory in this period was the idea of transference, which meant that an illness or a disease could be transferred to something else. For example, people believe that if you rubbed an object on an ailment, such as a boil, the disease would transfer from you to the object. There was also a popular theory that you could get rid of warts by rubbing them with an onion. Through transference, the warts would transfer to the vegetable, although I wouldn't recommend it myself. The growth of alchemy, which is transforming matter, an early version of chemistry, had an impact on medical treatments too, as people discovered new compounds. People began to look for chemical cures for diseases. This was inspired by Paracelsus, who we've mentioned before, the scientist who experimented with chemical treatments, and he experimented with metals as cures for common ailments as well. In the Pharmacopoeia Londonensis, which was meant, uh, published by the College of Physicians in 1618 as a manual of remedies, it included a chapter on salts, metals and minerals, some of which had been quite newly discovered. Among its 2,140 remedies were 122 different chemical preparations, including mercury and antimony, which is pictured. In small doses, antimony promotes sweating, which cools the body down, although this was probably being linked to humorism or other chemical cures of the time. Sweating fitted in with the idea of purging the body of disease. Patients would leave wine in an antimony cup overnight and drink the contents in the morning. In larger doses, antimony was used to encourage vomiting. Although it's poisonous in its pure form, a compound of it, known as antimony potassium tartrate, was said to have cured Louis XIV of France of typhoid fever in 1657, and it became wildly popular afterwards. Syphilis, which was a much feared disease that was called the Great Pox at the time, most likely arrived from the New World with European sailors and spread across Europe very quickly. Doctors were powerless to treat syphilis. Paracelsus wrote a clinical description of syphilis in which he maintained that the disease could be successfully treated by carefully measured doses of mercury, 
and it uh, doesn't really bear thinking about how this was sometimes administered. Mercury became the standard treatment against syphilis, despite being toxic to the sufferer. But again, this was a new idea that was being tried out for the first time, and there was still much to be discovered. So does it represent progress if it didn't really work? I'll leave that up to you. Some final points then. We're going to consider now about causes and treatments. What stayed the same? What changed a little? And what was brand new and changed a lot? We can then work out on our continuum, which we've used several times, whether this whole topic really can represents continuity and things staying the same, or change, particularly in terms of progress. So with causes, some things did stay the same. People still had some religious beliefs about the cause of disease. And some diseases were blamed on the imbalances of the humours, although both of these ideas are less popular than they had been before. That means there are some things that changed a little. Belief in the four humours faded somewhat. People were more likely to take a humanist approach rather than a religious one. But there were brand new ideas about causes too. Brand new theories such as chemical imbalances in the body were developed. And the first unproven links between sickness and microorganisms were made. But it would last until the 1860s and Pasteur's germ theory before this was really going to have a big impact on medicine. So what about the same with treatments? Let's think about what stayed the same. Purging and bleeding were still used as treatments, and also people still prayed for help. However, rebalancing the humours using chemicals such as antimony increased. This was related to an old idea, but had a twist on it. Using herbal remedies, only with newly found ingredients, were also tried. Remember, things like quack remedies and apothecaries potions have been tried before, but now they're using new remedies from the new world, some of which were actually quite helpful. Lastly, we got some brand new ideas. These were not necessarily helpful, but they showed a different level of thinking. Transference, for example. We've also mentioned the pharmacopoeia londoniensis, a bit of a mouthful that, and the chemical cures that it contained. There were also colour cures like the red cure, which tried to reflect some of the symptoms. And there were treatments based on ingredients from the same place. But think about the brand new ideas for both causes and treatments that we've looked at here. Very few, if any of them, would have a beneficial impact on people's health and the effectiveness of cures. So it's now up to you to decide. When it comes to causes and treatments, in the Renaissance, does this more represent change, progress, or is it more about continuity? I'll leave it up to you to decide for yourself. But for now, I'll say thanks very much for watching. I hope it's been useful. And if it has, please drop a like for the video and also subscribe to the channel for more. I'll speak to you again soon. Goodbye.